Hello and welcome to BSI webinar in collaboration with BRCGS, Must Know Updates to Issue 9. I'm Aprajata Singh, Food Marketing Executive in BSI India. Today's webinar is focused on key changes and key influences of, of Issue 9. Before we start the webinar, I would like to mention some ground rules. You all have joined in this session in only listen mode. We have a question box in the control panel where you can ask your questions to our presenter. Our presenters will do their best to answer as many questions at the end of the session. But if due to time limit, your questions remained unanswered, then we will send the answers via mail. The session is being recorded and you will get the copy of this webinar after the set completion of this session. Now, now, I would like to introduce our speakers for this webinar. First, we have Ben, ben Thomas, who is the Regional Head Asia Pacific in BRCGS. He leads BRCGS in South Asia Pacific regions with a focus on India, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and New Zealand. In addition, he focuses on global key accounts and digital products. As our second speaker is Sarath Chaudhary. He has a total, uh, a total of 24 years of rich experience in which nine years in food industry, covering aquaculture, fruits, vegetables, seafoods, and 15 years of experience in assessment and training in the food sector like meat, dairy, food, uh, seafood, processed fruits, and vegetables. I would now like uh, to hand over to Benz for his presentation. Over to you, Benz. Thank you. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, and it's just a single screen, right? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, the food uh, nine standards, issue nine standards that's been recently released. Before we kind of uh, deep dive into that, which I'm sure I'll take a few minutes to just go over, over uh, our corporate overview. We uh, started off in 1996 uh, in the UK and in 1998 we kind of launched uh, the first standard which was the food standard. So the food standard has been in existence since 1999 which has been rewritten, edited, added on etc as time has progressed. We also then have a packaging standard, we also then uh, launched the consumer goods uh, standard followed by the storage and distribution standard agents and brokers and then we kind of went on from there till we reached the ethical standard, the start standard as well as the plant based standards which are the latest ones. So what started off in 1998 as some retailers kind of getting together and trying to see how is it that they can get better efficiency when they conduct audits in, uh, in far flung areas kind of has become uh, passport to export for uh, globally. Uh, why I say uh, globally is because as I'll share in my next slides, uh, the, the kind of uh, coverage that we have when we uh, look at the whole world, uh, it kind of tells you a story that the RCGS is globally applicable and accepted as well. Aprajita, can we have the quest first question? You all are requested to please answer in which year was the food standard was first uh, published 2005 1998 2010 2015 so while you answer that i'll progress uh, so we are global leaders. What I mean by that is we were the first one to introduce uh, category exams for auditors. We were the uh, first ones to uh, 
talk about food safety culture, which has undergone a big revamp in this uh, particular version as well. And we were also the first standard to be GFSI um, uh, benchmark, as well as the first standard uh, uh, to kind of define food fraud. Uh, this is what I was earlier talking about. When you look at the uh, spread that we have uh, across the whole globe, we've got uh, 3,000 odd sites in Aprajita. Yes, ma'am. The the yeah the screen is kind of going off and on, so I just yeah. So we've got about uh, 3,600 odd sites in North America, Latin America. If you add Latin America to that, that's about uh, seven, uh, four, four and a half thousand sites. We've got Europe, of course, is the biggest uh, market that we cater to with about 14,000 sites if you include the UK and then the rest of the world that kind of comes in. So major chunk spread across the whole globe. And uh, that's what is kind of important. We also have 350 approved training partners, 77 certification bodies, and seven locations that we operate from. Uh, India happens to be one of those locations. So we've got about uh, 31,000 sites at uh, last count. In fact, more than that, we operate in 130 plus countries across the whole globe. And uh, annually, we collect about 185,000 non compliances which kind of impact about $800 worth of uh, uh, product sales. So that's the impact that BRCGS has on the supply chain. And uh, on that, if you could uh, put across the next question, Aprajita. Okay. So the second question is, how many countries have the BRCGS certified sites? Please select one of the below answers. And then Benz will tell you the right answer. Can we have the answers now? Yep. The correct answer is 130 plus. It was there in the previous slide. So we'll go ahead. So the, the question that uh, it comes up is uh, always is how does a certification or how does the BRCGS certification kind of add value to my uh, business other than being uh, giving me the ability to uh, either exports or export or be able to give it to a customer. Well, we all know how it kind of helps efficiencies, etc. So we went to the University of Burbank in London and we asked them to do a study on this, um, a, a long uh, drawn study that kind of enabled us to answer this question which, where we've kind of, uh, they spoke to lots and lots of BRCGS sites and arrived at a decision that 70% uh, achieved greater productivity. 30% benefited from product innovation because of the push that the standard kind of gave them. 40% reported fewer, 40% uh, reduction in uh, recalls. Uh, that's what I meant to say. And uh, But it's the commercial benefits that are also important to uh, look at, which kind of generate the dollar value. These are the commercial benefits that anybody on the technical side can actually go back to their management and say, if we do, uh, if we go with the RCGS uh, certification, this is what it kind of helps us with, which is 50% of these sites benefited from uh, domestic growth, 60% saw exports uh, growth, and about 47% uh, of them benefited from lower uh, number of audits, which kind of then helps you focus on your core work, which is uh, food production in this case. So uh, if you look at it overall, uh, there was a 6% increase in profitability of sites operating to PRCGS uh, standards, which kind of is good enough for uh, you to kind of pitch having BRCGS standards. Now, this particular report is available on our website for you to download. Uh, you can go there and download that. So apart from the food standard, we also have trainings, events, food safety, culture. We also have digital products like Risk, Horizon, uh, ESG Lead, et cetera, which if you want more information on that, uh, our website is right there uh, for you to look at. Now, when a site is certified to a BRCGS standard, they not only get the certification, but they get a host of other uh, benefits uh, 
from being part of the PRCGS uh, standard. You get access to insight reports, which kind of tells you how you've been performing over the last few years. Uh, if you've been uh, a, a BRCGS certified site for a few years, you get to use the logo license, which is uh, allows you to use the logo in your uh, commercial and your marketing uh, uh, products, but not on the uh, marketing material, but not on the products. Uh, you also get uh, technical support via BRCGS participate, uh, et cetera, and you get access to learning and uh, development uh, reports to benchmark your performance against your competitor. But the biggest benefit that uh, we've been told, and in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a big QSR chain, uh, a global big QSR chain, and they uh, said this, and this comes straight from the horse's mouth is, uh, whenever we need to look for a new uh, supplier, we just go to the PRCGS directory, look for what codes we're looking for, where we're, which country we're looking for, which standard we're looking for, and then we kind of get the list and we start working on it. So um, essentially that listing on the directory kind of has been getting a lot of uh, sites, a lot of customers, new, new customers. So that's one of the key and important thing for uh, any site, which is listing on the, uh, a supplier uh, shop window of BRCGS directory. These are some of the brands that kind of trust uh, BRCGS. Uh, some names are global, some names are uh, local as well, but a lot of them cooperate in a lot of countries. So let's uh, get down to the food nine uh, standard, uh, which is what we're uh, kind of uh, talking about the issue nine. Now, issue nine, uh, we have currently have about 22,000 certi uh, certificated sites, which makes food the biggest standard for BRCGS. We are seeing, uh, we've been seeing a growth of 5.3% and operate in 126 countries with uh, Italy, UK, China being the top ones, but India is also among the uh, top uh, five countries where food, uh, where, uh, for the food standard. Now, The in terms of timelines, um, we're right at the launch of the Food Night standard. It was issued in, in August 22, uh, which is 1st August, which means the document, the food standard, the interpretation guidelines all were published on the BRCGS website. Training starts in October 2022 and audits start in February 2023. Now, uh, Feb, 1st Feb 2023 is a hard cutoff date. What, what I mean by that is anybody who goes through a, an audit after on or after 1st of uh, February 2023 will be audited against the uh, Food 9, Issue 9 standard. So if you're a site that gives you a good window to kind of plan whether you'll be going in for Food 8 or Food 9, uh, so you can kind of uh, figure that bit out. Uh, Aprajita, can we have the next question, please? Sure, thanks. Can we have the answers now? Sure. Uh, what was the question? When will BRCGS food safety issue nine audits will start? Yeah, and February 2023. Yes. That's the date in, uh, that's the time when it will start. So all those who got that correct, thank you for paying attention. So uh, let's move on. Uh, let's look at what kind of are the key influences and the key drivers for us to kind of look at uh, uh, um, you know, unveiling the new standard. So the, what we did was what we always do with our standards is once the, uh, we've got a working committee, we've got an international advisory board that kind of overall looks at, uh, the standards and all what BRCGS does, which comprises of leaders from retailers, QSRs, food manufacturers, uh, et cetera. Now, um, then there is the working group, which kind of works on individual standards and the working group kind of identifies what are the big issues that have been there in the market. So we kind of uh, uh, put them together. 
then over the course of any new standard, uh, we kind of uh, issue position statements. Position statements are basically clarifications or small changes that are not incorporated into the main standard, but kind of uh, are there uh, to because the standard has been published. So what we do is we amalgamate all these position statements into the new standard. So all the position statements that we had issued for food eight were, um, have been amalgamated into food nine. The working group, which comprises of people from across the globe, kind of puts a draft together. The draft is then put out uh, in the public domain for feedback and comments. Once we get all of that, those inputs uh, then become part of the uh, standard. And uh, in this case, we've had uh, inputs from a lot of manufacturers, a lot of retailers, food service organization, certification bodies, independent technical experts, as well as a lot of sites kind of commented on, on this. So uh, if you look at this, uh, we will go through this uh, in a bit more detail, but the key changes that have happened are further clarity on the food safety culture. We've kind of taken into account the changes in codex that have happened, looking at technology, COVID kind of uh, taught us to look at things slightly more differently. So we kind of looked at that as well and uh, product safety activities uh, requirement and also the, the new add-on, which is uh, providing cl clarity on animal primary conversion and uh, producing animal feed, so which have been in, uh, incorporated there. So the, if you look at um, this, this particular thing, the focus has not been on uh, changing, this, uh, changing the food standard a lot, but allowing it to evolve. So food nine is an evolution of uh, best practices where attention has been given to uh, um, understanding um, product safety culture, uh, product safety culture in a lot more detail, the global applicability of uh, um, code, general codex principles of food hygiene to maintain the GFSI benchmarking. Some changes have been incorporated for that. And we've kind of given you more uh, audit options, which uh, are, have, we've learned, which are the blended and the remote approaches and of course, enhancing food, uh, product safety uh, activity. I think the key theme in this is um, how do you improve? How do you kind of iterate your own processes to kind of keep improving yourself? And I think that's how the internal audits, the root cause analysis, validation, verification, et cetera, risk assessment, incident management, and traceability kind of uh, fit in there. So the 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 question is that how do we look at these fundamental concepts and how do we enable them to enable you to enhance them, which kind of will take care of the non conformances that you've been seeing earlier and, and enable them to kind of trail off the site would not only benefit from uh, clearing the audit, but it would also improve the product safety controls uh, at the site. And I think that's the key message that we're trying to give with the new standard is how do we enable you to improve your product safety uh, controls so that you can produce safer and better products? These are some of the key changes uh, which we uh, which we will go in a little bit more detail uh, as we progress from uh, here. These are the key changes to the uh, protocol, which is blended audits and unannounced audits. Again, we will go through them in a bit more detail as we progress. Uh, meanwhile, uh, like a project I said earlier, if you've got any questions, please uh, pop them into the question box and a project will take them. We will try and our level best to answer all of them. Uh, the standard is fairly new uh, between Sarath and myself. We're kind of uh, understanding the standard, reading through it, going through it. Uh, so uh, if we don't know an answer, we will definitely go back to the technical team and kind of uh, answer it for you at a later stage. So um, basically, food safety uh, and quality culture was the first and foremost thing that kind of uh, uh, is important to look at. Now, the working group uh, kind of understood how behavior influences food safety. So this has majorly gone into the clause. The implementation of the food safety and quality culture started in food eight when we uh, incorporated the initial bit about uh, measuring food safety culture into the food aid standard. Uh, when 
when initially it started off, there were NCs uh, uh, that made it clear that uh, when we would start looking at the non-conformances, it was kind of made clear that it had a big influence in enhancing the uh, site, uh, the improvement of the site and people on site, because at the end of the day, uh, it's the people who kind of uh, live and breathe the culture. So the intention of this is um, not to change the, uh, it hasn't changed much in the current version. Uh, auditors aren't on site to assess the change, but they're there to assess your plan that the site has developed. So this is always, always, uh, the, your plan should always, always be based on your own considerations and activities and uh, examples of those activities is what uh, the uh, auditor will be looking at. So it is up to you to kind of figure out which are the important aspects of a food safety cul and quality culture that you want to focus on and kind of then have uh, examples of those activities or uh, to be shown to the auditor. Now, the, the new clause intends, um, in addition to everything else, kind of ensuring that there is a clear and open communication on product safety, your employees are trained you um, as a site hear back from the employees what they're trying to say make cha those changes as well and the overall uh, have a performance measurement uh, activity that kind of uh, tells you whether you're on the right track or not um, the basic uh, thing to kind of remember is uh, stuff as basic as hand washing now the question is if nobody was looking would 100 percent of your employees wash their hands uh, as and when required. If the answer is yes, then you probably got a very good food safety culture. If the answer is no, or mm, I don't know about it, then you need to revisit your food safety uh, and quality culture. So that's as basic as, as it gets. So what you need to do is you need to consider the behaviors, uh, define the activities, time scales uh, um, that you would assess them on, what steps would you take and review the effectiveness? Um, just to kind of give you a gist of uh, uh, this, uh, this food safety culture was, um, like I said, introduced in uh, the um, issue eight. This happens to be the top three non-conformances uh, with, uh, with sites not having a plan. Uh, the first year, uh, we were kind of focused on getting the plans in place. Uh, then it was all about reviewing it. I'm talking about food eight. And uh, the key thing to remember is that unless it's reviewed, it does not help you in foods, uh, food safety. So having a plan is one thing, reviewing it constantly is one thing and uh, the more, uh, is, is important. And then also ch uh, changing it to suit the current need is also an important part of food safety culture. So while you might have a very good plan on uh, food safety culture plan on paper. If you, if the if the auditor does not see the implementation, if the auditor does not see the benefits of that coming into play, then uh, you can be rest assured that the culture uh, component that you're kind of or the culture plan that you've kind of put together is not working. So that's something to kind of uh, think about. So that was the first big change that's uh, there. Uh, the next big uh, thing has a section that we've revamped is. Uh, as a result of the changes in Codex. Codex updated their version in 2020, and we've ensured that uh, any influence from Codex is absorbed into the standards, and uh, the clauses have been updated to kind of reflect that. The important thing here to remember in this particular bit is to have a validated HACCP plan. So, uh, this basically is a continuation of uh, the last slide, which is which talks about uh, the changes that have been there. I will leave it on for a couple of seconds for all of you to just read it. And of course, you can download a copy of the standard from the website. There is also a changes document that we've uploaded on the uh, BRC Bookshop, which you can download, which kind of gives you a clear understanding of uh, what changes have happened, which clauses have been deleted, which clauses have been added on. More about that towards the end of this uh, presentation. So um, 
The third big update that we've got is about outsource processes. Uh, we've kind of uh, gone into great detail in the standard to ensure that there is clarity. Um, the reason for doing that is because it can have a very big impact on product safety. This was updated in issue eight, but uh, we kind of felt that uh, more clarity was needed because in the last four years or so, the industry has evolved. So that's the reason why we've kind of uh, updated in issue nine. If you have zero outsource processes, you don't have to worry about it. But if you have, then this is an important bit for you to kind of consider as well. The next big change is uh, root cause analysis. Um, this is a strong tool. We consider it a core competency and uh, fundamental that a site needs to ensure that they are using effectively. Uh, we've got uh, examples of various uh, root cause analysis that you can use. Um, so, uh, but we kind of, uh, do, uh, the, what the standard is asking is, and um, not just to implement it, but look at it to ensure that uh, it does improve product safety uh, at your site. So I think that's going back to the central theme that uh, Food9 has, which is improving product safety. We've got uh, food defense, um, not massive changes here, but more in terms of alignment. So food defense and food fraud can now be part of the, uh, one plan and it kind of brings in more cohesion, more um, alignment from that perspective. Equipment. Now, equipment is a section which has undergone a lot of change. Uh, this basically has been done to ensure that we're kind of in sync with the industry best practices and that they're uh, taken into consideration Along with that, this also takes care into consideration the uh, legislation uh, which is applicable uh, for equipments. Now, there is always a lot of focus on new equipment. Uh, when a new equipment comes in, um, you get a lot of stuff, a um, lot of focus on that, but not there wasn't though so much of uh, focus on either hired equipment, secondhand or used equipment. So this section basically has been uh, updated to kind of take care of all of that because we that's a new that's a trend that we're kind of uh, seeing um, uh, across uh, the industry so the standard now more or less takes care of that um, so like I said uh, refurbished secondhand equipment new clauses on installation and uh, there is definitely a new clause on mobile and static equipment especially the chargeable ones or rather the rechargeable ones. The other big update that's there is with respect to animal primary conversion. Some new and some existing clauses have been kind of brought together. This is applicable to, uh, to sites that undertake slaughter of animals or slaughter or cutting of fish, which basically means category one, two, and four. Uh, new clauses are for compliance to GFSI, Traceable, uh, other than that, we've got traceability of edible parts and temperature monitoring that have been brought in and specific controls to ensure the food remains safe, authentic and legal during conversion. So that's that's a major story here. So uh, we like I had said earlier, we've got a key changes document. Uh, for food nine, which kind of uh, deep dive into which are the clauses that have changed, which are the clauses that have been deleted, which are the clauses that have been added on. So you can go to our website, uh, to our bookshop and download a co copy of this from the bookshop uh, in case you are more interested. Otherwise, a copy of the free standard is available for everyone to download. Uh, feel free to download that and go through it as well. Now, key changes to the protocol. Um, one of the key changes is uh, uh, this was some of the changes were done in as um, as position statements. Like I had said, for issue nine, we've incorporated these into the standard. So the key change is that one in three uh, audits will be unannounced is now uh, part of the standard and mandatory for sites. This requirement is valid across all GFSI schemes and not just BRCGS. In 
addition to so this is an important and a big change that has happened and details of this are in the standard as well in addition to this we've also got the a uh, blended blended announced uh, audits this does not take away the need for um, the unannounced requirement but this add, this gives a little more flexibility to the site and that's what the blended announced is all about so which essentially means there'll be a two the audit will now happen for any blended anybody opting for the blended announced audit the audit will happen in two parts one a remote audit followed by an on-site audit So how do you go about figuring out what your options are? So if you're uh, in an announced audit, you have the option of having an announced full audit, which is full on site, or a blended announced audit. If you're on the unannounced audit, which you need to do every three years, then you will uh, be on the unannounced audit rate, which is a full on site unannounced audit, no blended option in this one. This brings us to the end of uh, my bit. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of publications that we've issued uh, since the new standard came out. All of them are available on the BRCGS uh, bookshop. You can go down to uh, brcgs.com, which is the little uh, link that you see on the left-hand side of your page. Go, to, go there and look for the food standard, and then you'll be able to go to the store to be able to either purchase or download a free copy of uh, whatever you're looking for, depending on what uh, you're looking for. So the standard, as I mentioned, is available for free download and the interpretation guideline is available for purchase, uh, but both of them put together should be a good combination for you to implement food uh, stand uh, the food issue nine standard in your, uh, this, in your, at your site. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for patiently listening to this. Uh, my email ID and phone number are mentioned in case you want to have a quick catch up on uh, um, on any of uh, on BRCGS or what we do globally. Uh, more than happy to do that. Aprajita, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ben. Now over to you, sir. Okay, uh, am I audible, uh, Aprajita? Yes, you are. Yeah. So let's go to the first slide. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, uh, thanks to Benz for finding time to join us for this webinar and uh, giving us such a valuable input on the issue nine requirements. Uh, thank you. And thanks, Aparajita and Hitesh for making this webinar possible, organizing this. So I am just, uh, before we start with the question answer session, many of you may be having questions. So before we go there, I just want to briefly bring some information uh, of uh, or about BSI, uh, your service partner uh, for this initiative. So BSI group basically is a, a group based out of UK or United Kingdom. They're the national regulations body for uh, the United Kingdom and globally they also uh, extend themselves for delivering certification and uh, training services. Okay. Um, so uh, BSI Group believes that helping to build a world where consumers trust organization to do the right thing, balancing the drive for profit uh, with the need of the planet and its people. So that's basically the message uh, that BSI Group tries to deliver. It's also a royal charter company. That means it is uh, uh, eligible to uh, its service to the queen. So it's a Royal Charter branded company. Next slide, please, Aprajita. So uh, BSI uh, has their presence throughout the world. Um, as you can see from the spread here, uh, BSI has distinct presence in 193 countries, having more than 73 offices and 86,000 plus clients. Uh, so in terms of number of certificate issued, BSI currently is the number one certification body in the world. Uh, about 4,500 people uh, uh, and 11,900 experts associated uh, with BSI. Um, 
and we have delivered globally around 2 lakh 32 thousand uh, audit days in the last 12 months. Uh, in total, BSI uh, has uh, issue, uh, published 63,000 standard. BSI started off its uh, journey in the early 1900 as a, a body who publishes standards, standards for various uh, fields and sectors. So what you know as ISO 9000 or ISO 14000 today, PAS 220, which is today ISO 22002 one are actually all standards originally published by BSI. Um, so um, organizational resilience is something else I would like to bring to you today. Uh, that is after the COVID, we have all also realized the importance of uh, the resilience of any organization. We have seen several companies and startups going down during this lockdown. So this is where organizational resilience comes, where an organization can plan for future and make yourself itself resilient. Uh, BSI helps you to access new market, grow your current contract and engage retailers and distributors by providing assurance and certification for your safety and sustainability of your operation. BSI is a leading certification and training provider for a wide range of food safety and business standards. So we are there. We have a very strong presence in the food sector. Uh, so Prajita, please, let's go to the next slide. I'll just uh, like to bring to you a range of services that BSI can offer. Uh, BSI offers all kinds of audit solutions to the BRC standard, to HACCP GMP, ISO 22000, PAS 96, FSSC, uh, SMETA, RSPO, and Global Gap. So these are some of the main products uh, which BSI has a very strong presence in this part of the world. And in training also, we are there in all types of ISO, FSSC, and BRC training. Uh, we also have uh, customized training modules on hazard analysis and critical control points, food defense, food fraud, food safety culture, and BSI also has their own catering food safety certification, audit and training. Thank you all. Uh, Prajita, next slide, please. So if you are interested in certification, uh, specifically in, in if you are interested in a BRCGA certification, you have to get in touch with us. You have to fill a form where we will be asking you certain questions and basic informations about your site, which will be, which are required to determine the audit duration and complexity for your site. So once we do that, we will issue you uh, uh, estimate on the audit duration and the complexity. Once you agree, we will allocate a suitable auditor who is capable and experienced in your product process to carry out the audit. Okay. Yes. So uh, let us now go into the question and answer session. Uh, Aprajita, if you can please guide us through this process. We are there. If there is any question which we can answer, we will try to answer. If there are questions we cannot, we'll be most happy to take it to our global bench and come back to you with a suitable answer. Yes, thank you, Sarat, and thank you, Ben, for the lovely session. I hope this was very insightful for our viewers on issue nine. We have a few questions uh, from our audience. Um, first is, uh, do we need to follow any defined methodology for risk assessment on food safety, TACCP, and BACCP? Do BRCGS provide any support on the documents? Sarat, you want to answer that? Uh, yes, uh, I can. So uh, that's a good question, actually, quite um, uh, sensible. And uh, no, uh, when we are talking about risk assessment, there is a very general description and definition of risk assessment. OK, so if you are interested for further knowledge and study, you can always consult ISO 31000, which is the international standard for risk. However, uh, BS, BRC follows the same guideline of risk assessment as uh, any other uh, food standard like FSSC or ISO does. So it's basically uh, measuring the uncertainty. So you have to actually uh, stick to 
your risks identify your risk evaluate them and then deliver a result on the risk status so that's that's uh, so this result which you derive from the risk is what you will apply on the brc standard to determine certain uh, clause requirement uh, provisions for example environmental monitoring you need to go for a risk based approach so you, that means uh, it is on you to decide uh, how many sampling points you will uh, determine how many parameters you will test how frequently you will test all this will depend on the risk which is associated with your product and process and how how intensely you need to monitor the work environment for that process uh, thank you very much uh, let's go to the next question unless benz you want to add something uh, no sorry okay uh, so the next question would be uh, where can i download a copy of the issue 9 and how much will it cost yeah, so that's a question that I can answer, Sahir, because that's not a that's a non-technical <laughs> question. Um, so uh, you can uh, go down to the PRCGS website, which is www.prcgs.com. Um, there, uh, you will have to create uh, your login ID uh, to go to our store. But what you can do is on brcgs.com, you will see a tab that says uh, our standards. Uh, once you click on that, go to the food standard and from there on you'll go to food safety and from there on you'll be able to see the link that says um, you can download. Now, the free, that we have a free PDF, but you cannot print or uh, you cannot print the uh, PDF, you cannot extract anything. If you want to be able to do that, you'll have to down, download uh, the, uh, the uh, unlocked PDF, which is available for a price. So it's about 140 pounds for the unlocked PDF. For the free PDF, it's uh, there's no charge. It's free to download. You can download as many copies as you want. Um, and you also can request for a printed version, which is uh, available for another 140 pounds if you want. Yeah, next question. Thank you, Benz. Uh, next question is, when is the BRCGS certification getting started? Uh, uh what is the launch date it is confirmed yet yes so like i had shared in uh in that slide the audits will start on 1st february 2023 for food issue 9. okay thank you uh next question is uh when do the trading start and how can i schedule one for my company so okay the, uh, uh, Benz, uh then sorry, uh, I can answer that on behalf of BSI. Uh, BSI already is in the process of calibrating their tutors and uh, BSI will start a BRCGS issue nine training for uh, professionals, industry professionals from the second week of October. I'll repeat, BSI will start their BRCGS issue nine training from second week of October. Okay, uh, so if Benz, you want to add anything, otherwise we can move to the next question. No, nothing. Okay, uh, next question would be, uh, what would be the transition time for the customer for issue nine food safety? So it starts off on 1st February, 2023. So if your audit falls on 1st February or afterwards, so your transition time is now. If it falls before 1st February and you have confirmation from your certification body that uh, they will do the audit uh, before that, then you're on issue eight. So right now is the transition time uh, for anyone who's uh, going to be looking at an audit after 1st February, 2023. Okay, thank you, Vince. Uh, most of the questions are related to when the, when can they attend the training and could you please share the schedule. I would like to inform that we will be sending uh, this in our uh, mails. 
uh, followed by a survey link. Uh, so kindly wait for that. And many of them are asking about the PPT uh, that you have shared, Ben. Uh, they want us to share yeah. that. So yep, we can. Uh, yeah. So that will be in place. Uh, the next question would be, uh, which version will I be audited against if I sign up with the certification body now? So, uh, irrespective of two eight. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, so, ben, I just yeah, wanted to put in one sentence before you answer. So, if you if if anybody is getting audited before February 2023. Uh, then the standard that they will be audited against is issue eight. Uh, now, Benz, if you want to just add anything, uh, no, exactly what you want. You've said. So it's yeah. it's not when you're signing up with the certification body; it's when your um, audit will be scheduled. Now, the key thing to remember is if your uh, audit is being scheduled, let's say 27th uh, January, and the audit does not happen and you're unable to get it scheduled the next day or the next day and it becomes 1st February, you will be audited against food nine. So please plan accordingly, plan in advance. Do not, if you want to get issued, uh, get audited against issue eight, do not wait for uh, the, wait for January to schedule, schedule it or get it done, uh, get it done ASAP. But if you want the better standard, which is, or the evolved standard or the enhanced standard, which in this case is issue nine, then you can get done after 1st of uh, February. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Vance. Uh, next question is uh, regarding the unannounced audit frequency uh, of the audit, it, will it be the same or it will be changed? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, it is regarding the unannounced audit frequency of the audit. So, will it be same or it will it be changed? Mm, so, unannounced audit as per food issue nine uh, is once every three years. That's a GFSI requirement. So, once in a th block of three years, you will have to undergo a, a an unannounced audit. The best thing is to talk to your certification body and kind of come to a conclusion which year will that happen uh, or uh, let them choose it and move ahead with that. Okay. Next question is how many days a session will take for a transitioning training period from BRC 8 to BRC 9? Okay, I will answer that. So BRC has different training modules there are two modules available for sites uh, when we say audit for sites it means basically all the employee of the site who are associated with the brcgs food safety system so it is a, a general training for this team these people if there is an option of a one day sites training and a two day sites training uh, where the issue 8 to issue 9 changes and implementation of issue 9 will be discussed and for auditors uh, those who are already existing auditors for issue 8 for them there is a conversion course of, from issue 8 to issue 9 and plus we have uh, a three-day auditor course for first time participant and a five-day lead auditor course for first time Hello. Yeah, I think I thought I was the one. Yeah. Uh, Sir, are you there? I guess there's some technical issue. So yep. moving on to the next question. Um, so the one says, uh, can we have a pre-assessment for BRCGS issue nine food safety to make ourselves prepared in advance? Yes, um, you can. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I just got uh, out of uh, connectivity for a few seconds. So yes, uh, I did get this question. There is a pre-assessment available. 
and uh, wherever you are signing up uh, if you are signing up with bsi please send a request to uh, your coordinating representative and they will help you in setting up a pre assessment audit okay, okay. Uh, next question would be uh, will the unannounced audit will happen for issue 8 also currently we have issue 8 hope after implementation of issue 9 unannounced audit process will start um so okay, i will uh, answer that uh, i'm sorry uh benz let me answer that and there i will also like you to intervene because this is something which is an important issue so uh, just uh, i'll tell you what i have uh, uh, learned from my global team is that this unannounced uh, mandatory unannounced option has now started wherein mm -hmm. every site will get one unannounced audit in three years and it has started from 2021 sometime in the second half h2 uh, and so the consideration starts from 2022 so between 2022 2023 and 2024 every site will have at least one unannounced audit so let us consider it like that if you are certified on 2022 then in the next two years that is 23 and 4 one audit will be an unannounced audit okay so if it is uh, if your audit is happening before february 2023 and your cb decides to give you an unannounced audit then yes you can have an unannounced audit in issue 8 uh, or else it will be an unannounced audit in issue 9. So unannounced option has got nothing to do with the version of the standard. It is now mandatory that one out of three audit, every site will be unannounced. Yes, Ben's over to you for you also to comment on this issue. Um, no, um, I think you've covered uh, the bits. Okay. Um, Perfect. Uh, Prajita, next this, question, please. Yeah, I guess this would be the last question of this webinar. Uh, one says that what is the main difference between uh, FSSC and BRCGS? That's, that's probably a lot of uh, material has been written about it. I can definitely tell you uh, the USPs of PRCGS. One is, uh, like I shared in that uh, particular uh, slide, um, uh, you know, you get uh, kind of uh, the benefits uh, that are there, which is uh, the economic benefits of uh, being on the BRCGS uh, standard. The other is the re, uh, the updates that happen. So BRCGS standards are updated every uh, three to four years, which is why after issue eight, you're seeing the issue nine come up. And um, in a few months from now, my colleague Richard will start working on uh, issue uh, 10 as well. So that's the uh, way that it works. Uh, the other big um, the other big benefit with BRCGS is global recognition. So globally, uh, we we we're recognized by GFSI and SSCI and are covered by international accreditation. Um, I just uh, during my presentation showed you a little flavor of the kind of brands that uh, work with BRCGS and accept uh, the BRCGS standard as well. So, uh, but that's just a small list. There are a whole lot of uh, others who do that. Uh, we are customer led, which means uh, not only just the retailers, the uh, brand owners, but also sites telling us what they're looking for in a standard and how it can help improve food safety. And uh, we are, we also have a very strong quality and compliance team that, uh, that delivers, uh, um, uh, that delivers results that uh, brands can trust also our value-added service. I don't think anybody else offers the kind of value-added service that BRCGS uh, has, which could be in terms of the insight reports, food safety, culture excellence light, the technical support that we give, the listing on the supplier shop window. I would suggest you go down to BRC directory, 
brcgs and look for the directory option or go to directory.brcgs.com just randomly click on uh, something and see the first site that opens up look at the amount of details and the kind of stuff that's there from the site and uh, think about it if you were listed there wouldn't you be getting customers from there and uh, of course the BR, the usage of brcgs logo i've been to uh, trade events trade shows where uh, BRCGS certified sites have used like an entire panel just to splash the BRCGS logo to ensure that um, they kind of tell everybody that they're BRCGS certificated. So those are the benefits of being on the BRCGS standards. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, we have a lot of questions left. Uh, I guess we can take one more, uh, seeing the time limit. So the last question would be, during this mandatory un, uh, unannounced audit, the grade uh, will be with a plus awarded? I would think yes, but that's I'm not very, I will have to check with the technical team. Maybe that's a question that we can kind of answer um, in the, when we uh, yeah. uh, send out um, the... Just, uh... Yes, sir. If you were saying something, you were saying something. Yeah, just wanted to add one thing. That is, uh, if you look at the appendix of the standard where the unannounced scheme has been discussed, so it says that every unannounced audit grade will be uh, prefixed with a star. So uh, I guess yes, uh, your grade will come with a star, and then the next year when you get an announced audit the star will go up. That will give you an idea which audit uh, was an unannounced audit for you. So yes, uh, it will. But however, I think what Ben says is also a good idea that it will always be better if we can get it uh, clarified once with the technical team. Thank you. Uh, I guess this brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, we can answer that. Uh, sorry, Prajita, we can answer that. So um, if you look at page number 96 of the uh, standard, it says for a mandatory unannounced audit, successful sites will receive an unannounced grade of AA+, A+, B+, C+, or D+, depending on the number and type of non-conformities identified. So that's there. Okay. Thank you so much, yeah. Ben, that's, for yeah. that. For anyone who wants to read through that, that's on page number 96 of the standard. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, and thank you, Sarath, uh, for this uh, very insightful session. Uh, I would like to inform our audience that you will be shortly receiving a survey form from BSI, kindly fill that and share with us so that we can assist you with your future requirements. And uh, thank you so much for taking out time and joining us here today. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to thank BSI. you, Sajita. Thank you, Ben. And thanks, everybody, for these wonderful questions. I really enjoyed. Thanks. Thank you so much.